Yes, we are live. Hello, everybody. Happy, happy New Year, and welcome back for another episode, everybody. If not now, when? I am super, super, super excited today to introduce you my special guest, Jim Jerome. And everybody, you need what first thing you need to know about Jim is. He is someone who's really, really extraordinary. <laughs> He is from a little tiny, tiny town in Texas. Yet he had this big dream, with a degree in engineering, but a passion for investment. He actually started off his career in Morgan Stanley. And one more thing you need to know about Jim is, oh my God, he is such a nice person. He's such a people person, and really passionate about serving his clients.、Um, his people focus, client first approach, really enable him to win so many successes throughout his career. What is Morgan Stanley, later J.P. Morgan Chase, and executive at Wells Fargo. As a result. Jim also earned so many, many awards within the industry for rewarding him to helping his clients pursue their financial goals. And in 2017, Jim finally decided now is his time to shine. So he founded and created I Am Bridge in Austin, Texas, the most beautiful town in the entire universe. Uh, his intention, his goal, is to really assisting his clients on their pathway to success, including financial planning, portfolio management, risk mitigation, customer service, and so many, many more. With that, everybody, I am just so excited and honored to have Jim to join us today, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Wen. It's a it's an honor to to be here, and thanks for having me on. Of course, so excited to have you here. So, Jim. Take us back. Tell us how all those magic, how all the journey got started. Well, I did grow up in a little town called Amarillo, Texas. <laughs>、um, it was a it was a great place to grow up, kind of right in the middle of nowhere, <laughs>、um, <laughs> but absolutely wonderful people. Most people、mm-hmm. have stopped there going skiing.、Mm-hmm. Um, it's not definitely not a destination place, but it was really a fantastic. Fantastic place to grow up, and、mm-hmm. you know, I think you you learn grow, growing up in a in a small town, just you know, some some core values, and and you know, you see people around you being nice and friendly and and thoughtful and outgoing,、mm-hmm. and you know, I think all that stuff sort of rubs off on you.、Um, so came down and went to went to UT、uh, in Austin, you know, hook 'em horns, but <laughs>、uh, have an engineering degree and.、Mm-hmm. A lot of people say, you know, that's kind of a strange way to get into the financial services business. How does that work? Yeah, you have a jo- you have a degree in engineering, and you're supposed to be an engineer in a fancy firm. How do you pivot to investment? That's a complete, you know, ninety degree shift, right? Yeah, I, you know, there's not a lot of us that can't have an engineering background. I mean, a lot of this、mm-hmm. is, I think, most of the people in the financial services business are basically salespeople, right?、Um, but You know, I always w- w- was very good with numbers.、Um, I like math. I like.、Uh, <laughs> I was good at science and math.、Mm-hmm. I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but、mm-hmm. I knew engineering gave me a lot of different options.、Mm-hmm. So、uh, as I started in engineering school, I did put myself through school and、wow. had、uh, had student loan money, and I thought I had such a long time frame. <laughs> Between when I got my st- first student loan check in、mm-hmm. August, and I didn't have to make my last rent payment、mm-hmm. until December,、um, that I started to dabble into stock market. So I, I wanted to try to make a little money on that. Three、uh, months, you know, make make a little beer money、um, <laughs> in in the meantime. And、mm-hmm. it's nothing that I would advise right now that people do. <laughs> but it was the mid '90s, late '90s. The stock market、mm-hmm. was going up, and Um, and it really just got me interested in、mm-hmm. in stocks. So I started,、mm-hmm. you know, reading the Wall Street Journal and and watching CNBC, and I was just sort、mm-hmm. of was was drawn to it.、Mm-hmm. I didn't know that I wanted that to be a career by by any means, but but I knew I was drawn to it. What drawn to you, Jim? What 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 made you? It was it was just it's fat. the The markets are fascinating to me. It it incorporates everything. It's not just. 
Mm-hmm. It's not just numbers. It's not just a company balance sheet or earnings mm-hmm. or what the price is and what the mm-hmm. price is doing. It it involves kind of geopolitics and global events and and current events and news and social trends and and data and numbers and charts and it's just it just fascinated me that there were these enormously complex systems out there mm-hmm. um, that people tried to navigate on a day to day basis, and it's one of those things that that uh, you 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 know n- they're so complex mm-hmm. you don't know what you don't know going into it, and that was one of the really interesting things. Is like the more I learned about it, the more I realized I didn't know about it. It, it was a huge challenge, and mm-hmm. so I was just interested in it. Um, That's wonderful. I graduated uh, with with I knew I knew in engineering school I didn't want to pursue engineering as a career. Oh. Um, I, was, I it had hard, a, was it a hard realization? Because you take, you know, four years, there's so many classes, lab classes, you're realizing that was it a hard realization and actually sit with it and then decide. Um, I well, it was a it was a class where we were designing ball bearings. <laughs> and I thought, I don't think I want to do this the rest of my life. And uh, so I, I had some really good friends in college that kind of helped me along. I got a little frustrated and wasn't sure if I wanted to finish the degree or not. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, had some really good friends that helped kind of push me along and, and, and get across the finish line and get my degree. Mm-hmm. Well, then I started shopping my resume around and mm-hmm. um, it was, you know, I graduated in 2000 and mm-hmm. That's kind of right as the tech bubble was popping and Austin yeah. was, was a real, you know, got hurt by that quite a bit. Um, so so the there weren't as many jobs out there as there were just even a year before. Mm-hmm. And so shot my resume around and I ended up with two job offers. I ended up with a job offer from an engineering firm that was designing a uh, HVAC systems. It was designing air conditioning systems for strip malls. Wow. Um, it's a fancy job at 2000. It's a fancy well, amazing that job. was one. I had an offer for them and it was, it mm-hmm. was going to pay 70,000 a year and benefits and all the different things as a, you know, 22 amazing. year old that you want. And then I had another job offer from Morgan Stanley mm-hmm. and it was, it was paying $20,000 a year had a 95% failure rate, um, but it had unlimited upside. 95%, 95% failure rate? That's a very high rate. That's a very high rate. <laughs> you know, one out of 20 are going to make it. Um, How did you make that decision? That's a tough decision. You are first graduate, you know, you, you have tons of student loans. You're only 22. You don't know what you don't know. And then having two offers in trusted different compensation. How do you make a call? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 at the time, I thought it was fairly straightforward. Um, it, if I took the engineering job, I knew I wouldn't take the risk mm-hmm. of the financial job. And I would get comfortable with an income and I would, I would get, you know, it had limited upside mm-hmm. and I would probably have a great career, mm-hmm. but, you know, it wasn't real exciting and it wasn't, it, it didn't have the upside. It was low mm-hmm. risk with mm-hmm. low upside. Mm-hmm. And the the Morgan Stanley job had a lot of risk, mm-hmm. um, but it had unlimited upside. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to ever try this, this is the time to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm okay if I fail. If 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 I I'm okay, kind of emotionally thinking mm-hmm. that I might. I'm going into it thinking there's a very good chance that I do fail. Um, but. I think I can control it by how hard I work and and how, mm-hmm. how hard I learn and and what I do. I kind of mm-hmm. control to a big degree the percentage of of likelihood of success. Um, That's amazing. And I, thought, and I thought if if it doesn't work out, I can go get an engineering job. I can get go to graduate school and get an MBA. I could go to mm-hmm. law school. Mm-hmm. So I thought, you know, the downside is is maybe I have to go back to school or take a job I, I'm not real crazy about. Mm-hmm. But th- that was the opportunity to to go ahead and do it. So 
Um, you know, so you're started it. Optimistic. You're looking yeah. at outside. This is all I'm getting. I'm going forward, even though exactly. Exactly. Wow. And and it was like I say, it seemed like an opportunity at the time. And <laughs> Because I wasn't, I you know, I, I, while I dabbled in stocks, I didn't have a finance background. Mm-hmm. You know, I really didn't have any kind of sales background. You What's know that? nothing. Was it scary? Exactly. Though? You yeah. are excited, but yeah, you don't know anything about that. And they are such a high failure rate. So how do you measure? So tell us how that journey actually began. And was it as easy as it seems? Well, they came in and, you know, they, they said they, you know, they have a good training program. So, you know, these big firms have really good training programs. So, you know, the first day after I got hired, um, they came in with a, about a 700 page book and said, here you go. You've got six months. Um, you're going to take a, a test from this book. And if you fail, you're fired. Wow. And I said, okay. <laughs> Oh um, so that's kind of your first called a series seven. It's, it's, a mm-hmm. you know, kind of a securities exam. A lot of people fail in that business because they can't pass the exam the first mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Um, I passed it, which was a relief. <laughs> um, yes. took, a couple, took a couple other training courses and, and, um, started to realize again that I really didn't know as I learned more about it, I, I learned that I didn't know. I, I knew less than what I thought I knew. <laughs> um, so, so there were a couple things that were really helpful. Um, I made a decision to, and I was in an office where, you know, there were like 50 advisors that were mm-hmm. all fairly well established and had been in the business for 5, 10, 15, 20, you know, some 30 or 40 years. Wow. And I thought, you know, I can either try to do this myself and reinvent the wheel, or I can go and try to get some advice from people. Mm. So, you know, one of the best things that I did very early on is I went around to more experienced people Mm -hmm. and said, look, I'm brand new. I'm in the training program. Um, Can I have 15 minutes of your time Mm -hmm. um, to give advice? I'll do three hours of grunt work. If you want me to stuff envelopes or make copies or whatever, you got three hours of my time. Wow. Just give me 15 minutes of yours. Wow. And the fact is nobody really took me up on the grunt work, but they were more than happy to provide advice. Wow. And so I was able to learn a lot, you know, kind of condensed, consolidated advice from people that have been doing it a very long time. Mm-hmm. So that was a really good thing that that I think helped. Um, y- you know the the other thing that really helped sort of put things in perspective because I'd always thought about it from purely an investment standpoint, and the job mm-hmm. was trying to get clients to trust you to invest their money and trying mm-hmm. to you know thinking about the investment side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but my my training finished up. We went up to the Trade Center in New York City in Manhattan. Ooh. What day is that? What year is that? Well, we we this was well, I was up there for three weeks mm-hmm. on floor sixty one of Tower Two, mm-hmm. and my last day there after being up there for three weeks was September sixth, two thousand one. Oh my God! So my last day in the Trade Center was a Thursday, mm-hmm. and September eleventh was the next Tuesday. So it wow. it was really a um, very surreal experience. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I you know from fortunately I, the, all the people that I knew from training got out. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, that Monday before was my first day of my career. I had a business plan all laid out. I made 400 cold calls and wow. um, got a couple of appointments lined up. Mm-hmm. And then September 11th was the next day. Mm-hmm. So I had to completely change. It was, you know, obviously the world changed and you couldn't really cold call people and try to prospect people. So it really just made me focus kind of re- refocus in my mind and a big switch went off in my mind of this is a volatile time and people need help. Mm-hmm. Um, so instead of viewing it as I need to sell 
kind of sell something in order to to make my numbers and and keep my job for the next year. I, it just switched. That just seemed it seemed um, you know inappropriate. It seemed sort of silly. It seemed um, just didn't seem like the right thing to do. So I was able to sort of pivot and and think about helping people. Um, and that's really that 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 was the moment where I just kind of knew that I was going to be able to do this career long term yeah. was from that mm-hmm. very uncertain, strange, surreal, awful, you know, experience. But it's incredible to think about someone like yourself who are literally it's your first day at job and second day such a insane event happened and of course no one expect that and you able to stay calm and pivot your approach and really see this is opportunity for you to continue to even more serving your clients how would you always be this calm and this collective and really have that focus and really know the path ahead of you because uh, people easily freak out and say you know what this is not me <laughs> go back to my ac in the mall it's fancy i got my benefits Nothing will ever happen, but you choose, you know what? This actually is time, is a calling for me. I actually need to step up to serve. I'm a leader. I'm, I'm, my people is waiting for me. You have that pivotal moment and you make a decision. I think that is the reason why you're so successful today. I th- yeah, I think you never know what you're, how you're going to react until you get into stressful situations, you know, where mm-hmm. it doesn't, a lot of situations don't create character. They reveal character. I forget who's whose quote that is, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know why I, I think, I think I've, I've always sort of led to being a leader, but, yeah. um, you know, I think it's just, it's just sort of trying to do the right thing and what, what's the right thing at that point in time, um, you know, that you get stressful situations and you sort of have something down deep inside that says, I can do this and mm-hmm. you're going to overcome obstacles Mm-hmm. And there's going to be challenges, you know, mm-hmm. so you just sort of make mm-hmm. the best decision and go with it. Um, so aside from your professional perspective, you know, Jim, I'm yeah. curious, you were right there that Thursday before the big event hit, right? Yes. People who you know are, you know, um, fortunately, you know, everything's fine, but how does that impact you personally? How does it impact your perspective on life, on everything? Yeah. Because you are close. You are right there. I'm curious. You know how you can share that too. Yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, I think anybody who's been in a situation as close to something tragic and you 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 weren't affected by it, it was just pure luck that I wasn't there the week after. You know, I think I think it it made that kind of massive global awful terrorist attack something very real. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was it was spooky for sure. <laughs> Um, and you know, I think you just, I, I, you know, I, I don't, I think what you take from it is, you know, life is precious and, Mm -hmm. and it's, you you can have the best plans laid out, but things can change, Mm -hmm. you know, quickly and not, not always for the better. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you need to be prepared for thing times when, when, you know, they are going to get tough, whether it's Mm -hmm. career or, personal or family, you know, life, whatever. I think if you can think through the things that can go wrong, at least you're a little bit prepared for when things, you know, don't go exactly as you hope and kind of surprises come up. So, you know, it was, it was a valuable experience to be able to, to have that. And it was, a, it was great to be able to experience those buildings too. It was neat. I mean, the whole area was fascinating. Um, so it was, you know, being up there for three weeks, I felt like I knew the area and knew people and the, knew the the, mm. the city a little bit. And so, you know, you just have to take, learn from it what you can. You never know when your learning experience is going to come from. Okay. So now you pivot your career. Second day, traumatic event happened. You were like, okay, now it's time to surf. So take us from there, Jim. What happened next? Really nothing much happened that week. You know, we, we uh, sort of, I just had to you know, that our office let everybody go home. And Mm -hmm. I just had to think about how I was going to pivot to do something different. Mm -hmm. Um, And I started focusing on financial planning and trying to serve people and help people. And um, I got my first client 
and um, went out to sign paperwork. And I thought, you know, I was 22 years old. I, mm. I, I realized that I knew less than what I thought I knew. Mm. And I just thought, what is wrong with you people? Like, why are you, why are you signing up with me? I don't understand <laughs> it. Um, but, uh, you know, I brought a team together and, and, uh, we were able to, to serve these folks really well. But, um, when I went back to sign paperwork, um, they had baked me a cake and it, it, it was like, okay, this is, this is really good. Like there's something bigger than just an account, you know, mm -hmm. money in an account. It was very volatile and we're able to kind of create some clarity. And even though I didn't know what I was doing, I was able to get people who did know and did have experience mm -hmm. to help me with, with that particular client and what we should be doing. And, and, um, and they were very grateful. And that, that's what sort of set me on, you know, to get really excited about this career. And I kind of, that kind of carried over through, through multiple jobs and, mm -hmm. You know, it, ta it taught me that having a good team behind you is important. You can't do everything by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate you know, after I got a little experience with Morgan Stanley, I got hired by JP Morgan Chase. And before we connect, Jim, I'm yeah. very curious because at the first job, you know, the JP Morgan is a really defining moment for you to pivot and really stand out in a hundred percent. Well, 95% failure rate, you are that 5%. So before you go to the next journey, I'm curious. What do you think that made you that five percent? What made you stand out? What made you successful at that young age in that particular period of time? I, I think it was probably doing the hard stuff. It's doing the stuff that is not fun. You know, now I, I it it my job is a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested in markets, but I wouldn't call it you know a calling per se. I didn't I didn't know growing up this is what I wanted to be. It's not like mm -hmm. I knew I was going to be a doctor and I became a doctor. You know, it was sort of an opportunity that I took because I thought I could do it and I thought I could be successful at it. Mm -hmm. I've grown to love the industry and have it be my passion, so I think I'm doing my passion right now from a work Amazing. standpoint, but I didn't think it was my passion at first. And, oh. um, it was a matter of doing the hard things that nobody wanted to do. I mean, you, I, I didn't have clients. I didn't have a big network, network mm -hmm. of people who had mm -hmm. money. I mean, all my friends were, you know, poor like me <laughs> trying to, <laughs> trying to make ends meet on a month to month basis. And, and, uh, you know, so, so I had to cold call and mm -hmm. that's, that's just at that at that time, you know, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. that's how you did it. And wow. it was awful. <laughs> you know, I mean, you'd make a hundred, you'd make a hundred calls and 60 people wouldn't answer and 30 people would, you know, gripe at you and yell at you never to call you back. And why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. You know, five people would, you know, sort of give you the benefit of the doubt and entertain you. And then you'd have five that might be sort of interested and maybe you got an, a follow-up phone call with one or two. And so it's really easy to get deflated and to allow yourself to, you know, let the work, um, you know, the fact that it's not fun, that it's hard, that there's, you know, you have to overcome it. I think that's why a lot of people fail. I mean, it's just, you have to do the stuff that nobody wants to do. <laughs> so what, what kept you going though? You mentioned at the beginning, that wasn't your passion. That wasn't like, oh my God, this is the thing. Like you did not know that just yet. You, this is your first job and they are, everybody fail, right? What kept you going? Once you know, this is not fun. Like there are a thousand calls I need to make. How, how do you, what drives you? Yeah, I think, I think by that, by that point, you know, you start to, to put in some effort to it and realize you can do it. You know, I started studying and I liked for the most part, the material that I was studying, you know, I could do it. You know, you go through like, for me, it's kind of extreme. You go through a, you know, nine 11 mm -hmm. and that's extreme. That's easy to go to say, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to deal with this. Markets mm -hmm. are shut down and the economy, I mean, it's economy was poor. Things are crazy, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, but I think going through those things, you kind of learn that you can do it. 
And, you know, you learn if you just push through it, you start to get some success and then you, you know, get a client and you, you see that there's impact and, mm -hmm. you know, they bake me a cake. And, and <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think as, as you overcome those different things, I knew it was worth giving the effort. Amazing. You know, it was never a question of, of, I shouldn't give the effort because there's not some kind of reward or payoff or whatever. I, I thought that this was a mm -hmm. career that I could do. And mm -hmm. I thought it was a career that I could be interested in long term. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's overcoming those things and, and it just allows you to sort of push through it. And then you have to have a competitive. I mean, if, if you're in a difficult job that's, you know, low success rate, you have to be competitive to be able to do it. And I, I think, I think uh, I'm pretty competitive myself mm -hmm. um, in a lot of things. And so you just start going through it and he's, and, and it's, it, you control it too. It's, mm -hmm. I can choose to make these uncomfortable phone calls or I can choose to not do it. And if I don't do it, I'm, I'm not going to make it. Mm. So, you know, you just sort of have to make the decision to go, you know, take the next step and make the next phone call. And, and so I kind of did some little tricks to help me with that. But, um, you know, call blocking and time and, and different rewards and incentives and disincentives for myself. But you just have to do it. And I think that applies to a lot of different careers, mm -hmm. not just, you know, financial careers. It's reason people don't do things is because they probably don't like to do the little things that result in success. So now let's pivot a little bit. Um, you start off your career, wow, incredible success. So let's talk about, you know, when do you realize you want to be entrepreneurs? I think I kind of knew that deep down for a while. I mean, I, I, I wanted to have my own firm at some point. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there was a couple of, of times where I, I, I realized that. I think choosing the financial services career over the more stable engineering career was mm -hmm. that the first sort of looking back, I didn't think mm -hmm. this at the time, mm -hmm. but looking back, there was an entrepreneurial decision that happened there sort of subconsciously sure. mm -hmm. that I can do something that's going to create some bigger rewards than the ease, you know, maybe the more stable path. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was, I was, a. Uh, after JP Morgan, our, our team was hired by Wachovia uh, in mm -hmm. Austin to start the private bank. Mm -hmm. And that was an interesting experience because we had about three years, four years before the financial crisis when Wachovia basically went under and got acquired by Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. But it was very entrepreneurial. There, there were, they had just moved into Austin. They had just moved into Texas. They... It was a big bank that had a lot of resources, but it was very much kind of a startup feel um, where, you know, we were hiring a lot of people and opening all these new locations. And it was uh, it was a different kind of a playbook than, mm -hmm. you know, a well-established, you know, high market share bank. Um, mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed it. So the that environment was a lot of fun. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that was kind of the second time where I sort of realized that mm -hmm. I, I would like to, you know, start my own. And then in the, in the five or six or seven years after that, before I started Iron Bridge, it's just, you just start seeing some of the flaws in the industry as you, as you get experience, you, you mm -hmm. see things that you might want to improve upon that you can't do. In a big firm, you start to see ways you might be able to serve your clients a little bit better, start to see some of the problems with asset management that you think you can do better. Um, and that sort of evolved to starting Ironbridge and, you know, was able to have ha hire some really, really good people that, that are all still with me and, um, you know, people that, have, that I've worked with for a long time. Um, that, that have a similar client service mindset in our portfolio manager, Chad Carnes is, is fantastic. He was, you know, we were able to brainstorm different ways to improve upon asset management strategies and, and then, and then deliver it. So, you know, we just saw a little opportunity to, you know, mm -hmm. 
Let's take a second unpack that journey, right? You are in Wells Fargo. You are in you know this high executive. You're in a fancy suit. You are really incredible, you know, in your career wise. And you decide, you know what? There's something I can do better. Was it a hard decision for you to let go of that, you know, fancy salaries and all the things, and then start over? And how does that start it? Because when I talk, when we talk, I remember you were just starting a young family, which. It's pretty pretty challenging time, right? So talk talk about how does it all started. It was probably an easier decision than you might think. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you go back to the time Wells Fargo and Wells Fargo was a great place to mm-hmm. work, and you know had a lot of great friends that that uh, that worked there and and still work there. Um, you know, they were going through a tough period of time. That was when the, the kind of national account scandals were going on and. And they really made some big, you know, blunders, I think, mm-hmm. from up top mm-hmm. that um, that that was that made it easier. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, you start to think, OK, you know, the bank is doing all these bad things for their customers. It's like fundamentally goes against what I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so so it made it easier to mm-hmm. like it, you know, your loyalty to a firm that is doing bad things is less than a loyalty to a firm that, you know, is doing great things. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, they were good to me and I liked all the people I worked with, Mm -hmm. but I really disagreed with the decisions that were made from the top and other areas of the, of the country. Mm -hmm. And so it made it a little bit easier to, to go ahead and, and, you know, make a switch. How does it actually make a switch? How do you actually start it? I mean, I, 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 in, in this business, you get, you know, you get some experience and you get relationships and, and you, you become valuable so you can get paychecks from other banks. And I was getting offered some pretty big signing bonuses, you know, mm-hmm. kind of multiple seven figure signing bonuses to go other places. And mm-hmm. it just seemed like they all were doing the same thing as I, as I started to, you know, interview and have discussions with all these big investment firms. It seemed like they're all doing the same thing with a different business card. Mm-hmm. And so, so, so it was really fortunate. A friend of mine um, at the time was was starting his own firm, mm. and I took him to to lunch and was started talking. We we actually started thinking about creating a partnership together. Um, we re- realized we had different visions of what we wanted a firm to look like and do and and things. So um, we didn't create a partnership, but he was able to open up a lot of the research that he had done and kind of share his his budget and share the different third party resources that he was looking at. So it's again kind of leveraging what so not trying to reinvent the wheel and you know being fortunate to talk to people enough people where I, I came across you know a friend of mine who was doing what I was wanting to do and was able to share all this research and and things with me that you know kind of took me it probably took six months off of the overall process. Mm. Um, so there was a due diligence period where I was really exploring is this right mm-hmm. for you know, for, for me at this point in my career, you know, who, who might, uh, I want to bring with me and, and would they be interested? Mm -hmm. Um, and everything started lining up and I thought, you know, I think I've got a good idea. I think I've, I've, I've got the right things in place. I've started talking to some people and, and they're interested. And, you know, then it became a question of when, (laughs) and that's when we had a brand new family. So we had a, uh, Let's see. We had a one and a half year old and a newborn. Um, oh. And this was about six months before I actually launched. Mm-hmm. And this is when I really knew that I wanted to do this where I w- I'd work hard. I was a good employee at at uh, my, my previous firm and would get in at, you know, eight or nine o'clock and leave at four or five o'clock and give a good effort. Um, but then I'd come home and, and, uh, you know, help out with the family, put the kids down. Um, you know, my wife would try to sleep when, when the infant was sleeping. So I'd come into my office at home and start working and prepping for iron bridge and, and, you know, get a few hours of sleep and wake up. My eyes would pop open at three in the morning and I'd come into my office at home and start working on it. 
And I'd work on it from three to six or six thirty and help with the kids in the morning, go to my day job and come home and help with the kids, work a little bit till 10 or 11, get four or five Mm -hmm. hours of sleep and start working again. And, and I was just so excited about it. And that's when I knew I I, I just thought, okay, this is, I I mean, this is, this is what I, what what we need to do. There's a sign here. (laughs) Um, So it was, it was a a very busy time. And fortunately my wife is very supportive and, and, uh, you know, was, was, you know, we talked through the risks and the upside and what, what happens if, and all these different scenarios. And she was very supportive and, you know, so, so about six months later, um, went ahead and pulled the trigger and, and started. So you basically sleep three, four hours for six months until the day. Yeah, basically. <laughs> it wow, was- you are so determined, Jim. It, it was, yeah, it was, but it was fun. It was, a, it, that, that's when it didn't feel like a job at that point. It just felt like I was creating something mm-hmm. and it's, it was, it was really interesting. I think if there's entrepreneurs out there who have created a business, it's, mm-hmm. it's just something, it's kind of like having kids. You don't, you can't describe it um, <laughs> until you go through it, but um, it, it was just, it was exciting to do it. So, mm-hmm. so it didn't, it didn't seem like work. Amazing, Jim. I definitely love, love your passion, love enthusiasm, and that dedication truly is what, you know, enable you to create something so beautiful and so magical. So let's talk about entrepreneurship, Jim. You know, I, I'm sure it's not just a rainbow and sunshine and all the assignments, right? <laughs> um, let's be real for a second, right? What is, yeah. what is the biggest challenge you had to overcome? Let's start from there. Oh, there's I mean, so there's many. Plenty. <laughs> there's, there's a lot. You know, I think, I think, you know, cash flow is always an issue. You know, I think you can, it's hard to make realistic projections. You make all sorts of different scenario projections. And, yeah. you know, the, the I, I think it happens with most businesses where you get to a point and it's like, oh my gosh, like this is harder than I thought. Like, mm-hmm. did I bite off more than I can chew? Mm-hmm. And was this a good decision or was this a bad decision? Um, and you know, it, it, there are times where it's harder than you think. And it's, it's, you know, I think being an entrepreneur, you're probably lean more, you probably have an optimistic tilt. (laughs) Um, I don't think you do things, you know, you don't create a business or start a business without thinking it's going to work. Um, so I think, you know, entrepreneurs and a lot of people are just, optimistic and it's when it doesn't play out exactly like you think Mm -hmm. and like you hope and how you plan it it's difficult and so it's one of those things where you know kind of like we talked about earlier you you have you have difficulties you have to just understand what the best way path forward is and um you know so so we went through some pretty Mm -hmm. you know uncertain times and you know it was important to me to keep the team to keep our team involved and um you know we like we like our, our we had great client base and you know knew just it just took longer than we thought to get you know to kind of hit our milestones um yeah. right away but it, it it's you know sort of went like this and then you know it's Hockey started thing. taking off. <laughs> Amazing. So it's just kind of get making sure you get to that sort of launching point. So let's um, talk about this, Jim. You mentioned before that hockey stick take off, right? There are so many challenges, and you, of course, are optimistic, like every one of us. There's a time that's so hard. There's a time that you think, is, is this even the right decision? And there's a time you question, are you, you know, fighting bigger than you ch- you can chew, right? How would you move forward with that moment? And I ask that question because I imagine many of our entrepreneurs today in this uncertainty probably are being through that challenging at some level, right? I'm curious, what, what made you, um, Overcome those, and if you can share some thoughts on that. I mean, I think I think it was one of those those things that I intentionally didn't give myself a plan B. Mm, burn um, the boat. <laughs> so this is this is how it's going to happen. Um, I knew I could figure out a plan B mm-hmm. uh, if I needed to, um, but I intentionally didn't have a plan B. 
Wow. Um, I think I think I should have should have learned early on to delegate more. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I think you try to do more than mm-hmm. um, you know you, you try. There's a lot of different hats you can wear, and um, especially you know we we got third parties involved where where we needed to, and make sure we have good technology and. Um, you know, so we hired a tech firm and a compliance firm and all these different things, but there's still a lot on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. So, so I think it's a matter of kind of recognizing, I think the two things that, that I recognize that were really, really important and you know it, but it's hard to implement it mm-hmm. is, um, you know, really delegate and really let people, there's a reason you hire people and, you know, you don't have to be involved in every single thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you can be aware of what's going on and and understand and make sure things are happening like they should. But, um, you know, really turning over big parts to other people, mm-hmm. I think was kind of tough for me early on. I think um, recognizing that there are some clients you can you can serve well and some clients that you just don't need to serve. Um, that might not be a good fit. Um, so, so you don't have to try to try to win every single, you know, you, you can't be everything to everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's certain people that are just not going to be a good fit and it's best for them and for, and for you to, you mm-hmm. know, part ways or, or, mm-hmm. or just, you know, I've recognized that now that just, it's, you know, not, not dealing with that in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what, what is kind of really in our fairway. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so those are things that I think as, as we started to implement those things, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know, it sort of took care of itself, um, and allowing, you know, there's only so much time, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, making sure, you know, kind of focused on the right things that really move the needle that create a successful business. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think once, once I really started doing that is when, when it, it started to take care of itself. Sounds like Jim, along the journey, you learned a lot of incredible lessons and that enable you to truly, you know, start that hockey, hockey stick and going up. Right. Um, I'm curious if, if you have this magic one, you can change anything looking back in your journey. Would you change anything? No, no. I mean, it, it's, it, you know, maybe I wish I'd have made a putt last time I went golfing, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but, but looking back, I mean, I think it's those, if everything is easy, then where, where do you learn? You know? So, so I think, I think, uh, with everything with, with, you know, challenges with, Mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with rewards, I think without that, it, you don't really learn and, and it, and kind of what I, what I've found is when I was at the big bank, I thought, you know, my, my capacity, my, what I can do as an individual is not being challenged. Mm. I could have a great career, you know, I could retire, you know, relatively early, I could, you know, have a this just fine career in life, but I didn't feel challenged. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I was con- con- like continually underutilizing my own abilities. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I kind of went from that to business owner um where now I feel like I'm doing what I should be doing and I'm I'm, you know, using I, I just I just feel like I'm more, um, you know, using my abilities what I where where I can and and it makes even though it's, you know, probably harder work on a day to day basis. It's frankly it doesn't seem like work most of the time. There's definitely times where it does, but um, you know by by challenging yourself mm-hmm. and getting out of your comfort zone. You know, it's okay if if you make some mistakes; those are gonna happen. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't avoid mm-hmm. making mistakes. You can't avoid the challenges. But if you don't have the challenges, you're probably not pushing yourself enough. Um, and and so I just 
I, I wouldn't change anything because it helps. I, I have so much better perspective from, you know, from from the 9-11 thing and from, from the, you know, different challenges that that happen over time that, you know, it just I think it makes you better at what mm-hmm. you do. It makes you better, you know, mm-hmm. better able to serve clients, better able to, you know, serve employees, better able to serve my family, better able to serve your community. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it just kind of improves you if you're if you're pushing yourself and get getting out of your comfort zone. And you touch base on, you know, the mistakes and, you know, the some challenges that really enable you to shape today's successes. I'm curious, Jim, you since I really love to win the game that you are playing today, you know, how do you view failure? How do you view mistake? Because it's not fancy and glorious, right? I mean, no one wants to truly be failure. How do you able to see that and truly see past through that and truly continue to drive to next thing and, and until you'll find the success? I mean, you either win or you learn. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Sure. You know, there's only two outcomes. It's you either win or you have a learning experience. And Beautiful. if you don't, if you don't learn from it, then you wasted a perfectly good opportunity to learn. And mm-hmm. even when you win, you should be able to learn. But, mm-hmm. you know, winning can hide a lot of things that you might be doing wrong and mm-hmm. just not know it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's when you get the challenges and it's when you lose a deal or when you go through a tough time or when mm-hmm. something doesn't go exactly as you hope mm-hmm. that you can learn from it. And so, you know, it's... Uh, you know, I think it's all, it's all your approach to it. And if you, if you win, you win, but if you don't, you learn. Amazing. It's so beautiful. I you know, Jim, you are so incredible and yes, so humble and so open-minded. It's just, you know, such an incredible, incredible story to share. So thank you. Um, my last question for you, Jim, is, um, you know, of course, you share a lot of, you know, incredible lessons you learned along the way. And for our entrepreneurs who are listening today, right, you know, in this uncertainty time today where, you know, a lot of up and downs, is there something else you want to share with others that I have not asked you today that you thought would be beneficial for our entrepreneurs who are maybe thinking about starting a business or maybe already in the business, in the hustle, in the grind, in those small learning experience, learning opportunities today, right? Is, do you have any other advice you want to share? I mean, it's, it's so different for, you know, everybody has their own journey and, and sure. everybody brings their own experience and own goals and own, you know, it, I think it's probably don't, don't live somebody else's life and, mm-hmm. and don't, you know, make it, you kind of get out of your comfort zone and challenge yourself. And, you know, that it, there, there's uncertainty with that. But there's a lot of of good things that that can come of it. So wow. you know, keep keep make sure you work hard. Don't don't let it be your own fault mm-hmm. that it doesn't succeed. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, get out of your comfort zone and and you know live live your life. Don't live somebody else's life. You know, and I think I think if more people did did that. Mm-hmm. We'd have a lot happier people and, you know, pursuing things that that can challenge themselves. And there's reward out of that, even if there's uncertainty. So beautiful, Jim. And thank you so much today for coming and sharing your incredible story. You are so courageous and so intentional about who you are and truly live life on your purpose and, you know, go out there, do the hard work and with optimistic and yes, yeah, so humble, always to learn. I think, you know, your amazing attitude, your perspective to things, to life truly is what made you such an incredible, extraordinary businessman today. So I'm really honored. I want to thank you for being here today and really, really just, you know, so inspiring. And I also want to thank you for everybody who tuned in today. I really hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And I cannot wait to see everybody next Tuesday. Bye, guys!